Greetings, listeners, and welcome to The Spiritual Experience, a show where we share stories of life, love, and redemption for all of humanity on Earth. So sit back and enjoy. Try to identify with the speakers and not compare. Don't forget to subscribe on all podcast platforms. I'm your host, Jay Lewis, and here we go. Okay, ladies and gentlemen and identifiers or whatever, whomever you are, we love you all. Welcome back to the Spiritual Experience. We have a very, very special treat today with somebody that I have admired for a long time. And, you know, when you come into recovery and some of the guys that are quote unquote like old timers, when they take a liking to you, it's it's almost like, you know, becoming a Yankee and then you're the bat boy initially and then after a while you get to play on the field. So... Without uh, further ado, I want to introduce all of you guys who don't know him to my good buddy, Don. Hey, how you doing? And uh, thanks for having me. I think that you play me up a little bit, <laughs> no, a little bit too no. strongly. You know? No, you, you, you've earned it. You've earned it. Uh, so just so we can, uh, I mean, we were talking a little bit about, uh, you know, some of this stuff before we started about your lineage uh, in recovery coming from, uh, you know, a, a home where in, you know recovery was part of was part of everything. So, what was that like for you before you came into the rooms? Like knowing that you had like an inkling about this way of life. Well, it's interesting, you know, because <clears throat> I came up at the uh, tail end of the '50s, and you know, was a little kid during the, the '60s, and uh, my my dad was sober before I was born, and uh, he was not a, a big presence in my house. I'm one of seven kids, and all of the kids. Uh, you know, we're running around doing their thing, and my, my dad was always working or stuff. Um, and I did not, um, you know, we were kind of forced to go to my dad's anniversaries. What was that like? Like it when was you were just kid, like- weird, you know. Um, the interesting thing is looking back at it now, it has great value to me. But at the time, I didn't understand. I didn't get it. Um, How so- many sisters and brothers did you have? There, well, at the time, I, I've got... Uh, there's only five of us remain now, but there were seven. You know, oh I, was, I was the fifth of seven children. Oh, so the whole gang would go, and everybody's clapping. Yeah, and mostly. The- and then as they got older and they refused to go, there was less and less of us. But we went every year, and we often went to, um, like they would have, uh, my father went, was a uh, a big supporter, and his home group was... Um, was the Bay Ridge Group, and the Bay Ridge Group used to have these big dinner dances, like the Bill W. dinner dance, wow. you know, with all these people, and a lot of the local groups um, uh, would would join in, and they'd have these big parties, and they had this guy, God bless him, or God rest his soul, Eddie Farrell, who was like the uh, Lawrence Welk of AA. Wow. Uh, you know, and I remember these guys. I remember he had a gas station. We used to go there on a Saturday afternoon, and my father would sit and talk with him, and I'd be like checking out the gas station, stuff like that. Um, you know, so I had a lot of exposure to old timers. But when I was a, a kid and I was going to these events, I really didn't understand what the program was about. I really didn't understand um, what that was all about. It was just all these people getting together and having a big party. It was um, like a community. Very much a community. And I grew up at a time when um, I lived on a block where all the parents you know, hung out together. They'd all go to one house on the weekends and they would drink and who was chasing after whose wife and stuff like that. That was the norm. And my parents weren't there. And over time, I've heard people, neighbors, you know, uh, making comments about, you know, my weird parents because they were never around and they were antisocial. Meanwhile, they were out at all these uh, sober events. Right, with the other actual real weirdos Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's so i grew up to believe that my parents were weird right um i grew up at a time when sex and drugs and rock and roll was a way of life for a lot of people including myself eventually um and my parents were not part of that and as i grew up and got to the age where i'd be a little bit rebellious i started to see my parents as uh too strict no fun and you know not like everybody else my parents were the outsiders and in the society that i lived in they were right so i you know at 12 i went to one of these parties at a house a house party on my block my parents were out at some it was new year's eve my parents were out at some sober event and i went and i uh, uh, we stole a bottle from upstairs where all the parents were getting drunk and i got drunk for the first time and for the first time in my life 
What was that like for you? It was amazing. Yeah. But my first reaction was, they, you have to understand that I grew up in an environment where alcohol was the boogeyman. Right. My mother told me every single day that if I drank, I'd be an alcoholic like my father. And I didn't get it. Was she saying it like in like a, like oh, a like, resentful way? Oh, really? Or? Like, if you drink, you'll be an alcoholic like your father. And oh. I got that every day. My mother was very heavy handed. And uh, basically, I didn't get it. He, I, you know, he wasn't around. He was working all the time. You know, and, and, and he was he, already sober. Uh, and he was already sober. So, so you don't I, know I, that guy. I, 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 didn't, I didn't know. Right. You know. And uh, I had an experience where we started to talk about this before, you know, uh, for various reasons. You know, members of my family were estranged for a while. And um, I called up my, my brothers and I said, we have not, all four of us, there's four boys and three girls, but all four of the boys had not been in the same room in over 20 years. Wow. And I said, we're getting together. So we went down to Virginia Beach and we had this reunion but during that reunion there was a conversation the there was two groups of kids there were the uh, the three older kids and then there was a gap of about eight years and then those four younger kids and the four younger kids were all a year apart wow and the, the three older kids were no more than two years apart so they were you know the big kids and the little kids kind of thing and uh, and what happened with us was you know i got together with my brothers and my two older brothers started talking about the fun dad Wow. They started talking about if my father would come home with, uh, with half a load on and get down on the floor and they'd jump on his back and ride him like a pony and my mother would go nuts. Were you, were you mad that you didn't know that guy? No, I, was, I had never heard. I was you know, a sober a number of years before I even heard this story. Right. Um, and uh, it was just, it was interesting because it, it opened up my perspective. You know, my father was this guy that came home, and I used to, I used to say, and you know, I, I, God forgive me, you know, I used to say, this poor guy, he married this woman, and he's got to, you know, he's got to put up with this for the rest of his life, because she, he would come in and she'd be like, bop, 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 you know, she was, and then she got into Al-Anon, and no over way. the years she calmed down. So my parents were nuts. Right. I mean, you have one person who is living that alcoholic life and then the partner who ends up with like PTSD right. basically by the time he gets sober that she's been having to corral him for so many years at that time had these three kids you know and then obviously I mean this is not a time in America when people are just pushing a button getting a divorce and like whatever right. like people like because in my family like people would stay regardless of how many plates went against the wall. My mother once told me that she considered putting a pillow over my father's head and, and killing him in his sleep when he was passed out drunk. Rightfully she said, so. Because that was less of a sin than divorcing him. That's so wild. That's yeah, so wild. So, really from, wild. so from that party at 12 years old, what happens next? Oh, I just ran with it. They didn't want me to drink because they didn't want me to have that kind of fun. Oh. I fell down. It didn't hurt. I could talk. I was very shy, and and I wore my heart on my sleeve. So I was, you know, abused by the other kids and stuff. None of that mattered anymore. Right. So for the next thirty years, finally, you mattered. Yeah, but for the next, I mattered so much that nobody else mattered. I became th this uh, alcohol and drug driven selfish bastard. Wow. And um, and that went on for thirty years. It got progressively worse. The first ten years, we were, you know, we were kids. We were partying. We we're having a good time. The second ten years, it got a little messy. I was very, very good. My parents used to say things to me like, when you get arrested, not if, when you get arrested, don't call here because we won't come and get you. you got to deal with your own stuff. Right. So I became very self-sufficient. I knew what the laws were. Like if I got picked up for any kind of drugs. And back then, you could go to jail for 10 years for smoking a joint. You know? no now way. it's like anybody can do anything they want. I was like, well, that's weird. I knew it was coming, but it took a little longer than I thought. Um, but... Those were the days during the Rockefeller administration. You know, they had TV commercials with this guy who looked like a junkie with a monkey literally got his claws into his shoulder and him jumping around and said, get the monkey off your back. Get off drugs. Wow. They, they, you know, the, the egg in the frying pan, this is your brain on drugs, those sort of things. And we went to school and, and, and in, in, in grammar school, they would show us these anti-drug films that were really like over the top scary. You know, and then... I got, you know, and all of that was like, oh, my God, I'm going to stay away from that, until I realized that it was all a lie. Right. Um, and for most people, it's a lie that they can sustain. 
Right. But for me, being an addictive person, it became a life where I had to make up my own lies. I had to lie to myself more than I had to lie to anybody else to, to prove that uh, my life was okay, even when I was off the rails. You know? Did you have this addictive mind before you picked up? Did you notice that you were like that? Or was just this the first concrete proof like, hey, man, I can have this tunnel vision and where nothing else can matter? I probably did, but I didn't have any vision of that. Right. You know, it wasn't until I started drinking. And I knew, I, I had my first drink when I was 12. I knew by the time I was 14 that I had a real problem. Right. And I stopped when I was 42. Wow. So uh, it became a very big problem, you know. Did you, you went to, you finished high school, you went to college, what happened? Well, I finished high school, and I did very well in high school. I don't remember much of it. Um, you know, I went to Catholic high school, and I, uh, you know, I, I, I grew up, my brother was a year older than me, and he has photographic memory, so like, he never had to study, he, he was always the smartest kid in class, and I was somebody who really had to study and really work at it, but I was lazy too, you know, and, and I was high most of the time, so... You know, if I had a big test, I would really knuckle down and study and stuff. And I, I graduated uh, from a, a good Catholic high school. I don't want to bes besmirch anybody's name. Right. Um, but, but I graduated from a very good school with a four-year average of 88.8. .8. That's pretty good. I have no idea. I have no idea what they taught me. I, just, I, was, I was just, you know, out of, I wasn't there. So when that, it, That's one of the most beautiful things of being, of being uh, sober is I'm present. Right. And I think that, like, for me, when I was going, when I was evolving as an addict and alcoholic, I thought this was just life. This is the way it's going to be. And at the moment, I'm having successes, not so much in comparison to other people, but the successes I'm having is that I'm doing it my way. Mm -hmm. That's the ultimate success for somebody like me. Can I, can I... It, most of the time it's at the peril of other people and eventually the peril of myself. But am I able to be free? You know, am I able to be free? Is that what it, what it was like for you also? Yeah, um, for, in a big way. I didn't have to listen to my parents. I was living my own life, you know. I was, you know, I was living my own life. My parents, I, I grew up in a house, you know, in Bay Ridge and, and my parents... Uh, there's a lot of history there, but you know, my parents were pioneers in the business of alcoholism counseling. Right. And eventually they moved out and moved upstate to run a rehab center and left my brother, who's a year older than me. I think I was 19 at the time. So I, did, I never moved out. I stayed there until my parents put me out because we weren't paying the bills. Uh, I wasn't paying the bills. Uh, you know, and there was a lot of you know, uh, familial politics going on that I was not astute enough to deal with. Right, like the I family was, chess. Yeah, it was just there was all kinds of stuff going on, and I was just like, ah, I'm getting high, you know, I'm doing what I got to do. I didn't really care. Right. Um, and eventually, my my mother said to me, "Well, you're not paying your rent, you know. It's questionable whether I was or not." Um, right. I think that. Uh, do you think, was, in some ways, they were trying to intervene, knowing what path you were going down? Down, obviously, because of your dad and you know, and, and the business, they, were, they knew a lot about recovery, and then they're watching their own son. Imagine what it was like for them. It was a double-edged sword for them. Right. On the one hand, my father said to me one time, you're my son, I can't counsel you. Right. You know, he was a professional counselor, so was my mom. Right. Uh, my mom uh, didn't intervene, but gave me very heavy-handed speeches about the way I was living was wrong which for me was the wrong approach because I was right. like, you know, I don't think the way you're living is so much fun. Um, so basically, uh, I wound up going my own way, but I also, a big part of how I grown up and how I was treated, I was never encouraged or discouraged in any manner by my right. parents. I went to college. Um, I was very confused. I came out of this very isolated Catholic high school, went to Brooklyn College. It was this madhouse. I didn't know what I was doing. I was a frightened little boy. I was high. Right. And I found this bar, the student union bar. Right. I went to classes and stuff, but I started a drinking club, and the drinking club got out of control. They closed the student bar. No way. And I quit school. Wow. Because there was nothing there for me anymore. And it took me years to understand that. They closed the student union bar because I started a club that went wild in the student union bar. Right. 
And then they closed the student union bar. I didn't have any reason to go there. And it was literally, literally took me a long time to see the reality of that. Right, that everything is connected by a string. Everything was connected by alcohol and drugs. So what happened next after school? I, you know, weeks into just being home and laying around, my mother said to me, why aren't you in school? And I said, oh, I quit. She said, well, you better get a job then. That was it. There was never any discussion, you know. So I went right. out and got a job. And, um, but one of the things that I thought about when I was in college was that if I was going to quit, then I needed to go out and get a decent job and work my way up so that by the time the guys who I was going to college with graduated, I'd be making about the same amount of money of them coming in at that point, and we'd be in an even, even playing field. And at that time, that was, like, possible, not like today. Oh, yeah, today. it was definitely possible. It's, I, you know, I don't have a college degree. I never went back. Right. Um, I had an opportunity to go back. But I didn't because at the time I, I was offered to go to school and my company would pay for it. Wow. Uh, I had just taken my kids from my ex-wife and I was a single dad trying to raise three kids. And I made a conscious decision to provide a self, safe, happy, and I was sober, you know, safe and happy and, and loving home for my children. That was much more important than getting this degree. Right. Especially so. if you had like, if you were doing it, if you were already doing it. So... So you, you, you start working. How, does, how do you keep tumbling down the rabbit hole and to find yourself well, finally surrendering, saying, okay, maybe I should consider recovery? Well, I did a lot of lying to myself all the time. You know, things weren't that bad. I didn't have any money because I spent all my money on drugs. But I was getting paid next week. I still had the job. Right. And then it got to the point where I was losing jobs fairly regularly. And then it got to the point where we started losing apartments. Mm. And I had two kids at the time. Then I had a third child. Um, and by the time my third child was born, I was, you know, in pretty bad shape. I could get a job and I could keep it for a couple of months until they caught on to me and they let me go or I'd quit before they let me go so that it didn't look, you know, so I wasn't, my, I could... You know, I could fudge my resume a little bit. But um, one day, there was, and, and I married a woman who drank and drugged like I did. What was that like when you guys met? I was, I don't know. I look back at it now and I say, why would I have ever done that? I, you know, I, I met this woman. You were a young person. Yeah, I met this woman. I was lonely. You know, right. I, I didn't have a lot of friends because most of my friends had moved on and gotten married and stuff. And I met this woman and invited her over for dinner. She came over for dinner and she never left. Next thing I know, she's got all her stuff at my house. What year is this? 88, I think. Wow. When I got, when we, got, we got married in 88, so it was probably 87. So are you drinking and drugging like every day? And oh, yeah. then, oh. oh, yeah. And so is she. Wow. Yeah. Like around the clock. Pretty much, yeah. You know, I... At the end, uh, the last five years or so, and I was married for 11 years, in the last five years or so, uh, it was a, the base coat was, uh, and can you talk about this? <laughs> Whatever you the, want. The base coat was a case of beer, a quart of tequila, and three bottles of Coke a day. Wow. And then I was taking a lot of narcotics. Like, I was taking quaaludes to go to sleep. I was uh, snorting black beauties to wake up. Wow. And I was uh, smoking heroin. I was... Uh, there was a lot, of, you know, like anything I could get my hands on, and there was a lot of pills and a lot of, you know, other substances involved. But I was a case of beer, quarter to kill it, three apples of hope. And I got deeper and deeper in debt. And then one day, and I knew that the solution was there, you know, but I, I didn't, I still didn't understand my parents' lifestyle. And, you know, but I saw them grow up and I didn't know what I was seeing. You know, they were very angry and uncomfortable people when I was a little a little boy right and now i'm in my 20s and 30s and uh, and my parents are two of the most spiritual really happy people that i've ever known and i don't know how they made that jump right right so yeah. to, to you it's a jump because you know you have you're isolating yourself from any kind you know the days turn into years mm -hmm. when you live that life you know i know firsthand and then so you don't even see the evolution no. of how that happens you know? And the evolution didn't happen in front of my eyes. The evolution happened at meetings. The evolution happened at conventions. The evolution for them, <coughs> excuse me, was very tied to work. Right. My father was well known because he was sober for a long time. And the uh, Brooklyn VA, I don't know if you know this because I know you, you've done meetings there. Yeah. But the Brooklyn VA has somehow uh, got in touch with my father and said, we want to start an, uh, an outpatient program for alcoholism. Would you be the director? No way. And this is before 
there was ever anything like this. So the first outpatient treatment program for alcoholics on the Eastern Seaboard was at the Brooklyn VA, and my father was the director. Wow. And he was there for a number of years. And this is early 70s, I would think. Wow. You know? And, uh, you know, late 60s, early 70s. Uh, I was a little kid. And um, basically, uh, after being there for a number of years, and, it beca- and the, the program was very successful, he was lured away to Luther Medical Center right. to be the director of their outpatient program. And the, one of the big lures was that he was allowed to bring my mother along as a counselor. No way. And so, like all of these people who I knew from my parents and got to know even more, because now I'm not going to college, and for a couple of months while I was looking for a job, my mother's forcing me to go pick up my father on 49th Street, where the clinic was, and drive him and all his uh, local counselors home. So I got to know all these people, you know, and they were Mary Backus and and, uh, uh, I think it was Jim Cavanaugh. Were there any seeds that were like planted oh, absolutely. In, in hindsight? Or absolutely. you just like, these old people, fuck them. I just, I'm just Well, you know, in one way I was looking at it that way. But the other hand, you know, they're telling jokes and they're really funny and they were really nice people. And then I was forced into Alateen at one point. And oh. The woman who was the, um, the... Explain what Alateen is for people who don't know. Alateen is a, a very useful and very productive program. It's like an AA junior. You know, right. where uh, children of alcoholics, it's, it's run by al so it's part of the family recovery, right? Um, but you can go to al and you can, and, and it sort of follows the, the 12 steps and stuff. But there's a sponsor that's either AA or al uh, person. And the sponsor of the program was somebody that worked with my father, and I'd come home, and my mother would know everything that happened at the meeting. Uh. Uh, so as I said, I had no anonymity. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know? And when I started going to AA, I was Don Jr., you know, I had no anonymity. So now, you know, the home group that I'm in now, it took me a long time to get to the point, was why do I feel so comfortable here? I don't have to act a certain way. Nobody knows anything about me except for what I've told them. Right. And I'm actually anonymous for the first time ever. And it's, it's a nice feeling. And I, I don't regret any of the other thing. I don't have any resentments. Uh, but it was all subconscious stuff. Right. I wouldn't act a certain way. I wouldn't do a certain thing because I didn't want to embarrass the family. Well, that's another thing that, you know, we, we, you have to consider, you know, from an outsider's perspective, like, okay, your dad is this pillar in recovery on earth, mm-hmm. like on earth, right? And um, as far as 12-step stuff goes and, and everything else. And then, like, you're here, you know, addicted to drugs, alcohol. You have this marriage. You got two kids. You got one on the way. You can't hold a job. You can't do any of these uh, you can't. You're you're finding it hard to function, but at the same time, like you're, it's almost like, it's almost like like you're inside the Kennedy compound, mm-hmm. and then there's one loose cannon running around in circles. So, how did the bottom happen when you were finally like enough? My my ex drank and drugged the way I did. Um, she was also quite a schemer. Right. And one day I woke up and there was a knock at the door and uh, the police were at the door with the city marshals and they said, okay, you're being evicted, leave now. And I said, what? I had no idea it was coming. It was all set up by my ex. She had already made plans to move down to Jersey, take the kids and go live with her family and just leave me. And that's what happened. Is it because of how you were or do you think, what was the deal? It wasn't working. The marriage was miserable. We had no money. Um, and it, we were both alcoholic drug addicts who weren't doing the right thing right but in in that period i blamed a lot of the things that went on in my life on her right and obviously she did the same and she called up her family and said he's taking all the money he's doing this he's doing that she went to court i didn't even know we were about to be evicted she must have gone to court a couple of times at least and all of a sudden i'm standing and now I was at a point in my life where I thought I was a good dad because she was passed out on the couch and I was teaching the kids to read. I taught my kids to read. I potty trained them, all that stuff. Right. And I lo- the only thing, the only connection I had left to reality was my children, and I loved them dearly. And now they were waving out the back window of a cab, crying, and they were being taken from me by the one person on this planet that I wouldn't trust alone in a room with them. Wow. And as I was standing there with a bag of clothes and nowhere to go, a voice that was not my own 
came into my head and just said, nobody put you here but you. And all the lies I had told myself and all the lies I told everyone else and all the denial and all the BS melted away and I was crushed, literally crushed under the weight of that. I thought that I was having a heart attack because I had serious pain in my chest. It was just this... You know. It's like you've been avoiding the truth for so long and finally, a good, a good analogy, people, the way people have described it to me because it, it's similar to my own stuff is that like, you know, when you're an alcoholic and, an, and a drug addict life is basically a person driving a car, drinking beer and throwing all the beer cans in the back of the car. And then eventually when it comes to a stop, it always comes, it's never like, it's never a nice downshifting to an, it's always an abrupt like we're always the last people to know right. the brakes get slammed on and all these cans come flying forward for 10 years, 15, 20 years of you being out there. And then here you are with your bags, and your kids are gone and you're all alone. That's incredible. And uh, that was my first spiritual experience. Right. You know, I'm sure I had spiritual. I've, I've always believed in God, but then I was told that my what I believed was wrong because it didn't align with what I was being taught in school. Now, did you make the connection, like, at that point when you were just like, okay, like, I, I can't do this anymore? And then you, because you spoke a lot about, okay, I went to this Catholic school and it was strict and it was this. Were you thinking about that God or no. was it something else? I, I, it was something else, but I didn't know it at the time. Right. Uh, what, what, my first thought was, what do I do now? I'm never going to see my kids again. She's going to kill them. Right. Because she didn't, you know, she didn't take care of them. I took care of them. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, and this intense uh, hatred slash jealousy uh, developed over time. But that day, I said, what am I going to do now? And I said, well, let me call my brother-in-law, also in the program. And uh, my parents had come by and given her, I was in the shower. And they said, let me take a shower, I'll get back and I'll get out of here. I was in the shower. She called my parents, who happened to be in Brooklyn. Uh, they were, it was like a uh, Monday or something. They were going back upstate. And um, they came over and gave her $100 for a cab so she could leave me. No way. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Mom. Dad. <laughs> I didn't know this at the time. That's funny. But, uh, and, then I was, and then they left. You know? I didn't even see them. And then uh, basically they had given up on me and they had said, you know, you've got to do whatever you've got to do. Right. We can't help you. And um, I called up my brother-in-law. I was on a... a on a pay phone. He said, what's the number? And I said, let me read off the number to you. He says, wait there, I'll call you back. I'm like, oh, geez, you know. So I'm standing there with this bag of clothes and the phone rings and I pick it up and he says, yeah, you know, if you want to come and st stay here. Can I, I, I said, can I stay with you a few days? You know? right. He said, if you want to come here uh, and stay with me, uh, stay with us, that's fine, but you've got to sleep on the couch. They have four kids, two were away at college, they had two empty rooms, but I had to sleep on the couch. Right. Um, and he was instrumental in, in getting me two meetings and showing me the ropes that I love him and you know I have a great deal of respect for him he's 31 years sober now wow so uh, when what meetings did you start going to the starting point was the first meeting I went to no way and I walked in and I sat in the back and I was like one of those uh, football players on the, the 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 vibrating game the chair was literally moving around I was shaking so much right um, and I you know and then he took me to all the meetings in the neighborhood we went to once again we went to starting point we used to go to St. Rosa Lima I, I don't remember the name of the group at the time uh, it may have been Southwest right um, and um, and then you know up to Holy Name which I live right here by now for, for right. Hilltop and, but every night he took me to a meeting you know? now you now, you also knew the program peripherally, going to right. all these anniversaries right. and whatever, but still the first time you going in there for yourself, did you have any ideas, okay, this is the last stop for me or this is going to work? Like, what were, you, what, what were your thoughts? I had no idea. You, know, you have to understand that I, my body and my mind immediately went into shock. I was, uh, you know, I was jonesing for every kind of drug there was. I went into withdrawal for alcohol, cocaine. Pills, pills yeah. Pills, drugs, all at the same time. I was physically ill. I mean, stomach cramps, leg cramps, headaches. Couldn't sleep for more than 20 minutes at a time. Smoking a pack and a half of cigarettes a day. Um, that sort of thing. Always dehydrated. Uh, and that went on for a very long time. I, I would say that I really started feeling like normal healthy uh it took about six months wow uh, so and the other thing that we always want to emphasize here this was obviously a long time ago 
and um, even for myself, is that if you're having a problem and you want to clean yourself up, we always recommend you get medically removed. Right. You know, to go from the street to the folding chair, it's like, it can be dangerous, number one. It was. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. Was. You I could, could die. Have died during that you, period. hundred percent. You it, can die from alcohol withdrawal, from any of that stuff. So go get help. Go to a detox. Right. Go to a rehab I would or whatever. Certainly not recommend the way. No that I did it. way. And for me, it was about shame and, and, and guilt. Right. Don't let shame and guilt keep you from getting medical attention because it almost killed me. Right. My six parents, months. It took you six months oh, to was, dust yeah. yourself off, basically. And I got a job oh my after God. a month, and I was going to work. What was your first like, job? I, I I got a job as a, you know I. I I did some computer work. Um, so I got a job as a guy that was installing PCs at this company that was uh, going through a big growth spurt, but they were also moving from mainframe to PC networking. And it was pretty early on in the networking. So right. I, I started installing PCs. I was there every day. I did what I could. I sweated out a lot of the, a lot of the uh, things I was going through. I went to meetings every night, but I was, and and in. A couple of months or a month, maybe a month and a half, they offered me the job as PC support manager. No way. Uh, yeah, because all of a sudden I could think and I could be there and I could do. And you're, and, and you're showing up on time. Yeah, and I was there every day. I was there no matter how good or bad I felt. Right. And I didn't let that, I didn't tell everybody, you know, I, my big thing when I was drinking was if I didn't feel good, everybody had to know about it because you're supposed to be able to feel sorry for me. Right. All of that went away pretty early for me. I was getting to work, no complaints, no problems, no matter how dirty, how, how hard the job was, I got it done. They hired a couple of people to help me. I was very good at keeping them organized. And you know, the next thing, I worked at that company for 10 years. Wow, so you almost had like tunnel vision, like, okay, I have this job, you're putting, you're compartmentalizing your days. You say, okay, I'm going to work. When I'm done with work, I'm gonna to go to this meeting. I learned something very important for me very early on, especially early on in recovery. All you're thinking about is drugs and alcohol. Right. I got real busy real fast. Right. I didn't have time to think about drinking. I didn't have time to be, where's the next drink coming from because I had to keep this job. I couldn't lose this job. I'd lost every other job in the last 10 years. I couldn't lo lose this job. And my brother-in-law was really uh, great. What he said was, you know, I know there's two empty rooms upstairs, but you're sleeping on the couch. The reason why you're sleeping on the couch is I don't want you to get comfortable here because as soon as you have enough money, you're going to go get your own place and start your own life. Wow. And he gave me an envelope, and he said to me, here's an envelope. And I, and I said, okay. And he said, aren't you going to ask me what it's for? And I said, okay, what's it for? He says, every week when you get pay paid, I don't care how much money, but you put whatever you can into that envelope, and eventually you have enough money in that envelope to get yourself an apartment. And when you do, go. Right. In four months, you know, it took me a month to get a job. In four months, I moved out. Wow. Um, he was amazing. And, you know, I had lost the ability to think a lot of ways um, all I knew how to do was react when I first got there he said do you have a resume I said yeah but it's kind of old he said let's sit down and he helped me pump it up and he, he handed me the I didn't know how to get a job you know? right so he gave me the yellow pages which still existed back then he said look up temp agencies and I'll print out you know 50 of your resumes and every morning when I get up to leave for work at 6 a.m. you're up you're dressed and you get dressed nice put on a suit and you go out and you pound the pavement. Here's money for, for the subway. And you go to each of these agencies and you give them your resume and you say, I'm looking for work. And you take whatever they got. Wow. And it took a month. And I went out every day and I pounded the pavement. I was told not to come back till dinner time. Wow. And I went out every day and I pounded the pavement and I, I got a job, this temp job doing computers. And that grew into a bigger job. What happened with uh, the kids and everything during this time? They were being, uh, well... They moved down to New Jersey, and right. they, they were all living with their mother at the sister's house, and the sister, and I was the evil guy that made her into a drug addict. Sure. You know, and it, none of them was speaking to me. I was allowed to go down. I took the bus down. I didn't have a car or anything. I drove the, took the bus down to Jersey, saw my kids, and I took the bus home every Saturday. Um, they made it as, as difficult as they could for me because, you know, they saw me as the evil guy. Sure. Um, and Well, you were no saint. Oh, never. I never <laughs> saint. I was the I was, I, I, it's so, like, I always say it's like 50-50. Yeah, I, 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 well, I, I say it this way. I, I thought I was a good dad because I did all the things that good dads did, but how good a dad could I have been? I was high the whole Under time. Under the influence. You I know. thought the same thing. I used to say to myself, okay, well, if I'm playing Mario Kart 64 with my son, even though I'm completely five bags of heroin in and yeah. champagne and everything, like 
but I'm there, but I'm drooling on myself. Right. And I'm teaching him times tables or I'm doing this other stuff or I'm like, you know, but we're, being physically there is not the same thing as being there. You well, know? that goes back to what I was saying before about how good I got to, at lying to myself. You know? Right. The first weekend uh, that I was sober, so now I'm like a week and a half sober or something, right? And uh, I make arrangements. I go down and I pick up my kids. Uh, and I have no place to go with them. I don't have a car or anything. I take them to the local park. And I sit them down. And, and one of them was, at this point, the youngest, has been removed. And I don't get to see her because they sent her out to Long Island. And they refused to let me see my youngest child. And I was just completely out of my mind. But I went down. My daughter was nine and my son was seven. And I sat down and I said, you know, I just want to apologize to you. The reason why we're not together is that I have a serious drug and alcohol addiction. And my nine-year-old daughter looked at me and she said, you think I don't know that? Well. You think that when you come home from work and you're all cranky and nasty and everything and you go into your bedroom and you make a phone call and then the doorbell rings and you run downstairs with a handful of cash and then you come up and lock yourself in your bedroom for 15 minutes and you come out all happy, you think I don't know you have a drug problem? And I went, oh, my God. That's amazing. I thought that I had nine fooled. You know, I really did. I thought that I didn't know that they knew. And uh, that was a huge lesson for me. It, it, it put me in a position with the, the lies only. I, I realized that many of the lies I was telling only worked on me. Right, temporarily. Um, and I was really good at lying to myself, oh. you know, and that's something I have to guard against. But what I started to say earlier was I, I learned very early on in, in recovery that um, I, I couldn't lie to myself anymore. And that if this was going to work, I really had to do what people asked me to do. I, I was very proud when uh, I was maybe, you know, I'm like 22 years sober now. And, and when, when I was about eight or nine years sober, I invited my sponsor, who is still my sponsor today, thank God, um, to my anniversary. And the first thing he said was, I've never had a sponsee that actually tried every suggestion I gave him. Wow. And I, I, I thought about that, and it was really true, um, because I, now there's a God moment, right? There's lots of God moments. All of a sudden, this voice came in my head. It wasn't my voice. It said, the way you've been living is completely BS, <laughs> and you need to get your act together. Everything you've done to this point in your life is a lie, and it got you to where you are now. What right. are you going to do now? The second like, spiritual experience for me was calling up my brother. What he, my brother-in-law, what he was doing when I called him, he said, I'll call you back. He called my sister, his wife, and said, you know, your brother wants to come stay with us for a while. He just got evicted and he, he, wants, to, he, he wants to get sober. And she said, I don't want him in my house. But if you think you can help him, go ahead and invite him. He called me back. He said, yeah, come on over. You know? It's like such a sober, it's such a sobering thought to even be that thoughtful to ask his wife who happens to be your sister because many of us would be like no i'm the man of the house oh you want to get to and and then well i think there was they had the family had an agreement that no sure. one was going to help me <laughs> sure no exactly yeah. but but somebody but that was nice like listen that's yeah. time. sometimes yeah. i'm not that thoughtful to this day you well, know, like, <laughs> thank god for his spirituality right that's what i mean yeah. yeah yeah so the other thing that i wanted to ask you about because you're talking a lot about lying and honesty and whatever for me maybe this wasn't uh for you uh for me when i came like i didn't even know how to be honest mm -hmm. like i had True. in in taking suggestions and following instructions like and starting to get a sponsor and go through the steps like it actually gave me the formula on how to be honest like how do I get to my real truth mm -hmm. not be, because similar to you not only am I good at lying to myself I believe all of it like oh, it's yeah. all of the fiction oh. it's in they're all out to get me and you don't understand I'm an island and I'm gonna die on this hill and so was that what it was like for you when, when the lies, you say, okay, I know I'm lying, but how do I be honest about really what's going on? Was it unfolding for you similar to that way? It was similar, but it was a little different in the sense that I didn't even know I was lying. I was just, everything that came out of my mouth was absolute truth. Why would I lie to myself? You know? And my sponsor was absolutely great with that because he never ever used the word lying. Right. He said to me, do you really think that's true? 
like, you know, like you're saying this. Well, I had an epiphany when he said to me, I was ranting and raving because I was like maybe, you know, 20 days sober. And uh, my ex called me to complain about something one of the kids did, and she was wasted. And I was like, I can't believe that my kids are with her and she's drunk all the time and blah, 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 and this and that. And he says, you're jealous. I said, I'm not jealous. I'm afraid for my children. She said, no, you're jealous because she gets to drink and you don't. And I said, that's not true. And he goes, eh, think about it. It was true. Um, it took me probably a couple of days at that point. I was absolutely lunatic at the time. You know, so uh, it probably took me a couple of days to say, you know, maybe he's right. And I, and I didn't say he's right. Maybe he's right. Maybe I am jealous. Maybe, you know. And then eventually, you know, I was able to admit to myself that, it, you know, I was angry. But uh, I was, my two emotions were anger and, 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 and despair, you know. So if I was angry, that didn't mean I was jealous. It meant I was angry. And, you know, that started the whole thought process of, well, what made me angry? Yeah. And how I, valid I, is it? I could never find the source of my anger. And that was the first step. Wow, maybe I really am jealous. That's why I'm so annoyed. That's why I'm so angry. I, and, and it's anger and fear, you know. I was, for three years, while I was getting sober and, and she had my children, and my children were not being treated well, I had this, it, it wasn't until I, I, I couldn't admit it openly to myself, but I lived in fear that I would get the phone call that my children were dead because she had crashed the car while driving. Sure. You know? Um, and it wasn't until I had taken my kids on a weekend and not brought them back. And there was this sense of relief that was just, it was literally like a boulder being lifted off of me. And then I realized what it was. But a lot of my recovery has been like that. You know, um, I didn't know I was lying to myself until my, my um, sponsor started to say, well, you know, is that really true? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, that... Maybe the way you, they look at it and the way you look at it is a little different. Right. Like there's, I mean, there's always different perspective. And in the sense of, you know, if somebody tells you that you're jealous, that is something that you, that it's, is palate is not palatable, but it's malleable. You can deal with that Mm -hmm. anger. There's nothing to do with anger except for suppression. Right. Right. It's just, it's a reaction to something else. When somebody would explain that same scenario to me and I'd be so angry and it, and they would just break it down and say, maybe you're not jealous, maybe it's this other thing. Mm-hmm. Like, and right. always with the maybes. Right. Always with maybe. the maybes. And the maybes, you know, have me call into question my own sanity because I didn't understand what jealousy was. Yeah, I didn't even right. know what envy was. I didn't know what any of that was. Or self-righteousness. Or when somebody says that you're addicted to self that everything is about you. It, it doesn't even, like nobody else matters when you're in those moments, that you're not even thinking about the kids. When you really understand, you're like, oh, I'm disguising my jealousy with love for my children. When, you know, both things could be there. You right. can say, okay, but it has to be proportionate. Right. It has to be, and that's why we need other people's perspective on Otherwise, it turns into how dare you. With every situation, I'm the victim. I'm the right. victim. Eventually, it becomes, well, you know, my, my mom or my dad, they didn't love me the same way that they loved my sister. And she got everything, and they gave her a car before her 16th birthday, and she was this big collegiate. All, the whole story, which many of it is true. But meanwhile the things that I put them through with my addictions and my attitudes might be, my parents couldn't even leave the house without taking their car keys with them because I would just take their car every day at 12, 13, whatever. So if somebody did that to me, I'm I'm surprised, I'm grateful that they even have me around now, the way that I treated them, the level of of uh, empathy and of forgiveness that they show me that now if they say or do the wrong thing, I have to realize that I need to let it go because of that. Because I could, you know, I don't have the right perspective all the time when I'm mm-hmm. thinking about yeah. myself. I had only one perspective and it was my own and it was very, very twisted. Right. The only thing I ever thought about was me and how I was going to manipulate and steal or whatever to get what I needed and nobody else really counted. Now, on top of that, I'm still trying to uh, juggle these kids and. Make sure How do you get the kids? 
Well, eventually what happened was, you know, I really did try to do the best I could for my kids, and, and I was very angry about the fact that I wasn't getting any, any assistance with that. She was just wasted the whole time. Um, and uh, we, I was... I stopped paying child support because I got a bill for $50,000 from the IRS, and she was the one that did our taxes. Right. And I said, well, I got to pay this. I can't pay both. I won't be able to afford to live. Um, and so she took me to court for child support and won. And I couldn't afford to live if I was paying all of the child support to her. Um, and then it became this big thing. So I, I and my kids were really li living a, a terrible life every time. I would say to them, look, that's, I'm getting better. At some point, I have enough money to move you in with me, but I don't want to make this this big trauma like it was the last time. Right. When you're ready, you let me know. And then things got worse and worse down there. And every time they sort of indicated to her that they, she was very manipulative. Like, we'd la rather live with dad. She got him a puppy. They weren't allowed to have a puppy. Eventually she had to get rid of the puppy because they weren't allowed to have a puppy where they lived. You know, we're going to move to a bigger place, stuff like that. I just took them. I went down on a weekend. I got divorced during this period because I was getting bills that she was running up because I was still married to her that had nothing to do with me. Right. And I was advised to get divorced. She didn't show up. The judge gave me a, div a divorce by default and gave me custody of the kids. Wow. But he had no jurisdiction of the kids because they lived in Jersey. Jersey, yeah. I took them. I brought them to my house like I normally would do for the weekend. And I said, kids, you're living with me now. By this time, I had... Gr I had uh, moved into a bigger apartment. They had their own rooms and stuff. You know, the girls had a room and my son had a loft bed in my room. Um, you know, all that stuff was already in place. And life began. And it was, it was really quite something. Oh but uh, I took them and then, she, you know, it took her about a month to get up the gumption to uh, come to the house with the police. And the police came to the house and I said, uh, I don't want her in my home. The kids were hiding in the bedroom because she was ranting in the hallway. And um, I showed the the divorce papers to the, to the lawyer. I said, this was signed in Brooklyn. We're in Brooklyn. The judge says the father has full custody of the children. Said, Sorry to bother you, sir. He left. That started a 15-month um, really difficult court battle for me um, because, you know, unfortunately in the family court system in Brooklyn, if you're the guy, you're wrong. Yeah, I, at that I, time, I'm not, yeah. I'm not exaggerating. No, of course. You know, and she'd show up, not, not show up, or show up drunk and curse at the judge. And they say, all right, we understand. You know, and I wasn't allowed to speak. But I had a lawyer, which was well worth it. And eventually, we got through that. But by that time, the kids were already living with me for, you know, a year and a half. And, and they were doing well, and they were doing well in school and stuff. So, uh, and then I, um, I don't know, um, three or four years after I took the kids, I, I met someone. And she fell in love with the kids, I think, before she fell in love with me. But, um, you know, eventually we got married, and uh, she loved the children, so now we had a more complete family. And, right. Um, and, you know, those kids are now, oh, my God, my daughter's going to be 32 in March. My uh, son it will be 30 in March, and my youngest, my, my, young, my daughter, uh, will be uh, 26 in May. What's and the relationship with them now? Oh, they're great. We, we have a great time together. I'm so proud of all of them. None of them are alcoholics, thank God. Because uh, uh, that's like a genetic thing some, a lot of times. Oh, it is. Oh, it yeah. is. It's you know, not. They, I, I gave them a speech when they were in their early teens saying, your mother and your father are drug addicts and alcoholics. Both of your grandfathers were alcoholics. Uh, you got a pretty good shot at this. Right. So you really need to pay attention here. And, you know, they had their episodes. Uh, nothing too serious, but. You know, I sit them down and go, remember we had that talk about if this happens, it's a red flag. Well, last night, you hit every one of those red flags. <laughs> so maybe you should really take a look at whether this is how you drink or if it's a one-time thing. Right. Yeah, no, it's so <coughs> important to have that conversation. I had the same one with my son yeah. where I say, if you're genetically predisposed to have this disease, whether the emotional, the mental part, the spiritual part, most like, most importantly, the physical part of the sickness where once you start, you cannot stop, that has nothing to do with you. But I'm letting you know that in our family, alcoholism and drug addiction is like Sunday dinner. Right. You know, so you come from this lineage, so you need to just, I would never tell him, all right, you can't drink, you can't smoke pot, you can't do whatever. 
but I would let him know that like you you could have a problem with it, and if you do, it's going to be very bad, you know. Yeah, and luckily for me, he doesn't. You know, one but. of the things that was super important to me, I was the my mother told me every day that I was going to become this monster. Yeah, you're because gonna be was, like your father. There's this boogeyman oh. out there, and I said, you know, I'm not going to do that to my kids. And I literally sat them down. I said, if you go out and you drink so much that your friends have to bring you home, that's a bad sign. If you go out and uh, you drink so much that you don't remember what you did last night, yeah, that's a pretty bad sign. If you go out and uh, and you drink so much that you do something that you wouldn't do when you're sober and you're embarrassed, um, that's a that's a, a, a red flag. And I, I listed about six or seven, you know, pretty serious red flags that I had done regularly right when i was drinking and my daughter went out one night and came home at like two o'clock in the morning woke up the whole house because she couldn't get her key in the door the dog was barking her yeah, that's funny night. so i came in and she was like oh i'm so sorry and i said oh my god i see myself here you know yeah and she was really drunk and i walked her up to her room and i put her to bed and then i went into the bathroom and 30 seconds behind me she's knocking on the door she says i have to go use the bathroom i said you better go downstairs because there's another bathroom down there so I go in and I get to bed. My wife says, what was that all about? I said, eh, Providence is drunk. I shouldn't have used her name. But, uh, okay. you know, my daughter's drunk. And she says, I don't want drunk in this, in this house anymore because she had lived with an alcoholic. She's sure. Out. And I said, you know, I'll talk to her about it tomorrow. So I'm just falling asleep. My wife says, she didn't come back up. And I said, okay. And I go downstairs and knock on the door. There's no answer. She's asleep on the bowl. Nice. So I... I help her up and I bring her up and I put her back to bed it's about three o'clock the next afternoon I, I went in and I said to her you okay and she said yeah I said I just want you to know that when your friends have to bring you home because you drank so much that's kind of a red flag when you um you know do something that you know would, would embarrass you that's kind of a red flag uh, when you don't know what to stop that's a red flag when you wake up the whole house because you can't get your key in the door that's a red flag and um and I said, when your father has to go downstairs and get you from the bathroom and bring you up and put you to bed, and I can tell by the look in her eyes that she has no recollection of this. Right, the black. So that's a red flag, and the fact that you don't remember it is a big red flag. I said, you know, and she's going, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, don't be sorry. I said, I just need you to, and we'll talk about this in a couple of days. I really want you to think about it. Is this how I drink, or was this a one-time thing? Right. Because this is how you drink. You're in for a world of hurt. Yeah, yeah. I said, I just don't and want to And you can't even anymore. save them from that. Yeah, so a couple of days later, I, I had a conversation with her. She said, no, I don't drink that way. She said, you know, she was kind of shy, and she was, these were people that she worked with, and she went out with them. She was underage. She, was, she wasn't 21 yet. She was yeah, 18 yeah. or 19. And she said, you know, people kept buying me drinks. I didn't want to say no. And, this, you know, she told me all this stuff, and I said, well, here's a few hints. I said, if you only drink your drink down to halfway, nobody's going to offer you to buy you the next one. And no one is going to give you a hard time if you say, no, I think I've had enough. I don't want another. And she said, oh, I never thought of that. I said, if, that's, you know, if that was a one-time thing, that's great. You know, she told me, she was in for Christmas, and she told me, she said, I, I don't drink anymore. I said, oh, did you have a problem with it? She says, nah, it just caused a lot of money, and it really didn't do me any good. You know? She said, you know, we, went to the, we, we were in Colorado. And she said, I went to, the, to the, the weed shop and I got these edibles. She says, what a waste of time. I ate it and I fell asleep. <laughs> it's so funny. So, you know. But you can see, like, mentally the difference where she's saying to you, people were buying me drinks and I didn't want to say no. Right. Where, like, if somebody was buying me drinks, the thought of saying no would never even enter my mind. Didn't I enter would just hers say, either. thank you. But was, for different reasons. Right, exactly. Key, you know, for me, it was, yeah, keep feeding me drinks. Exactly. Don't for her, for it was, her, it's just I like, don't wanna, I don't, I don't want them, to make I want any, them to like me. Right, exactly. Yeah, where, yeah. you know, I had the same situation with my son. He was in, uh, was he in junior high school. He went to Cavallaro. Anyway, so he's in junior high, and I see, you know, I somehow hacked into, at that time, he had like a Facebook or a MySpace or something. I hacked into his social media. I see that he's like smoking weed. Right, he's, you know, cause kids don't know how to hide things effectively, especially if their parents are addicts. Like, you know, you'll never, it's very rare. So I see that he's doing it, and he's, he's coming home, and he's, you know, he's, he's sleeping on the couch after school, whatever, that kind of stuff. And I let it go for, like, a whole semester. And then he failed, like, everything, right, in school. And then I, the conversation I had with him, I was like, listen, if you can't somehow pass gym, then maybe smoking pot is not for you. I'm not going to tell you don't do it, but I'm just saying for yourself, look at, 
it's one thing if you're going to fail chemistry, calculus, whatever. But you failed gym, brother. In the eighth grade from smoking pot, it's, it's probably not for you. And, um, and then he just, you know, he went his own way. And, he, you know, I'm sure maybe he smokes a little bit here and there. But, you know, we, we have to be grateful, man. I mean, oh, your dad, you, look, your brother-in-law, that means your sister married an alcoholic. Your wife came, she already had experience. She an right. Like, it's so, you know, here we are circling this drain. And then, you know, two things that are happening. One, you know, if you don't have a child that's living with the sickness, that's incredible. But most importantly is that they don't have a dad that is, like, not just living with active addiction, but not drinking, not drugging, and just enduring life as an angry, dry, unsensible person. Well, you spoke to your daughter like a human being, not like a, you know, not like, not from a place of, you're not talking, well, you're talking with her, you're not talking at her or through her, right? (coughs) Excuse me. I never had, um, my parents never talked to me about it, you know, my mother when I was high and stuff would talk to me about how I shouldn't be high, but I never had the kind of conversations that with my parents that I have had with my children. I never lied to them, you know. They never asked me about uh, me being on drugs. Like, are you high right now? I would have told the truth, right? Um, but obviously, they knew, right? But um, there was a number of things that happened. I was always very honest, especially I had a, a very interesting conversation and a very interesting relationship with my oldest, and. Um, She's the one that said to me, I don't drink anymore because it was boring. You know, I was like, holy cow. Um, but I had a conversation with my son that uh, I said, you know, you're Don the Third. Right. <laughs> the first two really went off the rails. And I'm hoping that we can break the chain with you. And this is something you don't hear a lot. Now we have sober dads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, uh, you know, talks about that. But you don't hear a lot of, about it in, in regular meetings. And I said to him, you know, I hope that we can break the chain with you. Uh, but one of the things that really has become uh, huge for me and the breaking point was, I, his name is the same as mine. Right. He's going to Binghamton. I get a letter. It's addressed to me. I don't know if it's for him. I open it up, and it's about him being disciplined for underage drinking. Right. So I called him, and I said, I'm really sorry. I didn't know this was for you, but uh, you have to know that this came. And, he, and I said, you want to talk about it? And he talked about it, and I said, you know, you know you did the wrong thing. you got to take your lumps, whatever. you got to pay what you owe. punishment is. And then I started looking into it, and he was being overpunished. And, I, and he said, oh, I have this call that I have to make with this counselor. I said, can I join the call? And he said, yeah, if you want to. So then I get on the call, and, and she explains what happened and everything. And I said, I just want to make a couple of points. My son told me that these people came in. It was a party in a dorm room, and the campus police came in, and they checked for everybody's ID. And 15 people in the room said that they didn't have their ID with them. So they said, all right, go. And five people who had their IDs, they took their IDs, and those five people are now being punished. So you're teaching the students that the best way to deal with this is to lie, because I I don't believe that all those kids did not have ID in their pockets. They just lied. And so by being honest, my son is being punished. He did the deed. First of all, they had all these weird rules, like, if you got caught with a case of beer, you got this. He had one beer in his hand. He had two sips out of it before they came in. He wasn't drunk, and they were throwing the book at him. And I said, I read your rules of discipline, and your rules of discipline say that if you're caught with, like, with one beer, you should get a warning. You're putting him on probation for a year. Maybe you should read your own rules. I said, this is a kid who uh, is very respectful. She's, that was the first thing she said. You know, he's been very respectful. We told him he had to take this online course on age drinking. He took it the next day. You know, and I said, yeah, so the guy who you want to be a good student at your school is the guy that you're punishing. And you really need to look at how you're doing this because you're teaching these kids that all they have to do is lie and they'll get away with it. Right. So, but he's an honest kid. So they were like really apologetic. They removed. But the, the end of the story is late, later that day or the next day, he called me and he said, thank you so much. He said, nobody ever stuck up for me like that. I said, well, you know, you got to do the thing. I said, but remember, there's a couple of things. Like, you now have this on your record. If you go out and get drunk and walk back onto campus and the guy at the gate stops you and realizes you're drunk, 
They could throw you out of school. This should not be on your record because you were supposed to only be warned. And I said, and you're willing to you know, do the right thing, so why shouldn't you be treated fairly? And he was like really impressed with that, and he and I, and it really opened up a whole different kind of uh, relationship for us. They called me a couple of weeks ago and said, I've just applied for the job of president of my company. He's 30 years old, and he's probably going to get it. <laughs> you know, like, where did this kid come from? You know, um, right. But you know, it, it, this kid came from seeing the, the really downside and the bad side of alcohol and drugs in both his mother and his father. Saw his mother die of this disease. Yeah. And saw his father get sober and grow up. Redemption. You know, and, and you know, he, we have a great, you know, I have this kind of relationship with all of my children. And I am incredibly grateful. And I pray and I meditate before I have a serious conversation with them. We recently, my wife and I are doing the steps together. It's the advanced program. Um, and uh. it's, really, it's really quite something. But we did uh, uh, step nine um, and made amends to each of my children. And each of them had a very different reaction. But my oldest said to me, you know, it's been great seeing you and, and, and my stepmom, you know, grow in this program. Although she doesn't think she needs it herself, but the jury's out on that. Um, but uh, she said, you know, that the way that you have proven that you're serious about your amends is that for the last 22 years, I've seen you at live it. Right. My son said, you know, I think it's great, and we talk a lot together, and you offer me a lot of good advice, but sometimes I can't get a word in edgewise, which is true of me, as you might have noticed. Um, so that's something I need to work on. And, and my youngest uh, said to me, you know, I am really happy to be, and now she was around the longest. She only recently uh, moved out. She says, I'm really happy to see, you know, how you guys are growing and stuff. And the biggest complaint that she had was that, you know, we would have arguments in front of her. And that would, you know, after the business with her mother and all the yelling and screaming and everything, uh, that really makes her uncomfortable. So she said, you know. I see how you're not doing that anymore, and I'm very grateful for it. And now I'm out, and the fact that you're not calling me every day and you're letting me have my own life. I said, well, that's what this is about. And I am eternally grateful. And that, you know, those are spiritual experiences for me. Without the, the help of AA and God, I would not be here today, and they would not be who they are today. Absolutely. All right, let's wrap this thing up. Don, it was an incredible i got to talk to you for another hour, but uh, we got a meeting to go to. This is true. Absolutely. So thanks a lot, everybody. We'll see you soon. Peace. Thanks for having me. God bless you all. Bye-bye. We want to thank you all for joining us today. And please don't forget to like and subscribe on all podcast platforms and find us on Facebook where you can become part of our family. We'll see you around.